Hello, everybody. I'm seeing people are still dropping in. I'll give you all a minute or two. People are, uh, people are still trickling in, so I'm seeing about one person per 15, 10, 15 seconds. I'm gonna give another minute if that's okay. People who are just joined, uh, we're just waiting for people to trickle in. Um, hope you all are having a great day, great oh, the summit. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to get started. We have about a chunk of people. So, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sai, and I am a product manager at uh, VMware. Uh, and my uh, primary product area uh, uh, is building an uh, open source Cloud Foundry for Kubernetes project, uh, also called CS for Case. And I'm here today to go through a journey uh, of, a, of a developer who wants to build a cloud native apps on Kubernetes and uh, ch the challenges that they are facing, uh, that they face with Kubernetes in general. Uh, compare that with uh, CFOK uh, and demo, uh, you know, the, the full experience uh, from pushing an app to actually curling the app. We will also take a look at the inside, the guts of uh, CFRK, and then talk about generally the complementary relationship uh, between CFRK and Kubernetes. And finally, just talk about where we are going next and how you can get started. Um, so quick note on presenting this remote uh, for someone, uh, I'm hoping you and your families are safe um, during this some uncertain and tough times. Uh, ideally, I would love to do this in person and be interactive, but we are doing this remote, uh, and the tool we're using, um, it, you know, is a bit uh, limited. So I recommend you to hold off your questions, um, or you can add questions to the Q and A, and then I'll do my best to answer them at the end. If I can't get to all of the questions, uh, you can ask me uh, in the Slack channel, Track Cloud App Development. Um, and I'll also maybe share a Google Doc and we can asynchronously answer those. Um, all right, so um, let me the first slide. So let's build an app with a node app for Kubernetes. My goal is to just keep it a bit interactive uh, and, and see the journey from a, a developer point of view. Um, so I, this is an app. Uh, I'm an app developer building apps. Um, I write code, I test, and I debug locally. Uh, this is my inner loop, uh, which I love doing it all day, making money, right? So far, so good. Um, now it's time to push to production. Uh, unlike the old days where uh, you hold the code over to DevOps team, uh, now with the introduction of Docker, uh, DevOps teams expect you to provide so both packaging and deployment instructions uh, by Docker. All right, so 
Okay, let's address packaging right now. Uh, Docker is a common way, I mentioned, to ship an OCI compliant image. Uh, since this is a norm now, uh, as an app developer, I have to now understand how to use Docker and some of the constructs uh, that goes with uh, the Docker file. So a few constructs that come to my mind is looking at the base image, you know, uh, the run and copy instruction. Uh, you can actually even run your Docker image locally. But with the Docker file, there are more questions uh, than answers for me. Um, and here are some of the uh, subset of questions that, that, um, that I have put it on the, on the screen. Uh, and this is just subset, there are many other. But some key sort of related concerns uh, are, are related to ops, DevOps uh, uh, teams, yet it's on my plate. Um, so for example, base image. What base image should I be using? Right? Uh, can I use a base image that I found on stackoverflows.com when I ask for what is the best Node.js? you know, base image, um, or should I use an all-inclusive Uber image that has all of the app dependencies, uh, you know, lets you, helps you write less instructions if you use that. Um, but how, how about original those images? Um, how often do they ship? Who owns these base images? And how often do they ship CVE patches? So these are all the trade-offs you have to think about between uh, questions and trade-offs you have to think about when writing a Docker file. Um, and, you know, so, so that's a, sort of one way of looking at it. Um, but I'm not gonna highlight all of these questions, but one thing that uh, I wanna highlight is the uh, key thing is the image provenance, which you see in the labels here. Um, it's, it's extremely important to establish image provenance. So you and your DevOps teams can answer some basic questions of your cluster, like where did that image come from? What version of code are you running in the cluster? If you don't, <laughs> you will have a bad time. Um, so sort of thinking about this, uh, moving on, right? You build the Docker image, you're happy, now you can test locally, all right? Fine, I have to test it twice. Um, let's think about how will this work on Kubernetes? Uh, one thing I, I did forget to mention, uh, forgot to mention is the, um, is the registry. Now we have to worry about where should I push my uh, images? I mean, hopefully DevOps teams will provide one but how often should I prune that registry? That's some of the questions that would pop up as you use another sort of dependency. Okay, so moving from sort of Docker image, now your DevOps teams who wants to use Kubernetes. And now we have to start thinking about what are all the ways you can deploy your app. So even more new constructs and, and sort of new YAML. Uh, here on the left, you see uh, you have defined a new deployment um, which actually is pretty intuitive if you, if you think about it, but it doesn't make sense for an app developer to define it, uh, for maybe an ops, DevOps person you've made. Um, you need the services to go with that. Uh, you will need to test this on cluster, but if you're, and if you're consuming other services, you will need to uh, need their deployment services uh, configuration uh, to validate that all of that works as expected. And then things balloon up, right? You need to think about how will, what kind of configuration uh, you will have to uh, uh, provide uh, what kind of configuration the users can configure. So more YAML, if you may. Uh, so for example, how do you, um, how will you share your config and sensitive info with other services or provide a way for users to configure them? Uh, how about encrypted communication between microservices that you want to use uh, or external network? Uh, all of that was just day one, right? Like all of this, you have to start thinking about these are the things you need um, and you have to configure them by hand. So uh, those are some of the day one uh, concerns. What about day two? Uh, just quick primer on day two activities. Activities for day two are anything that required once the app is in production. So what I mean by that is, for example, on your left, you have to worry about observability logging, metrics, so you know how your apps are performing uh, and helps you debugging if you do encounter issues. But it's not easy to pull these directly from your deployment. Uh, yes, there are projects that help you with collection and indexing, but, there, you, but either you have to deploy them yourself or you have to share that with other uh, apps and uh, installations that are on the, on the cluster. Um, a few other things, the ICD. Um, you, you may have a CI CD that will trigger on new code changes, uh, build the image, test it, and push the image to the repository, and then finally update the Kubernetes 
to visual.com. Uh, the blue box indicates that it is something that you should be doing. And I'm hoping you're all employing continuous integration and delivery. Uh, reach out to us if you're interested in how we do it. Uh, we do it, uh, our complexity is 10, 10x compared to sort of uh, because of how many projects that we, we build and ship. Uh, but there are other variety of uh, other automation that you have to build. For example, patching the base images, uh, the language dependencies that go with that. What about search? You know, when they expire, you have to rotate them. What about credentials? If they get compromised, you have to rotate them. This is just to name a few, uh, but these are all the DevOps concerns that you are required to own or co-own with them. Um, so speaking of that, as an app developer, in my opinion, you should be spending majority of your time on, on your inner loop, which is you know, code, debug, uh, and test locally, and other times monitoring your app uh, in the production so you can collect useful feedback from your users and then iterate on your apps. Um, so sort of amplifying this, you know, the problems actually uh, you're seeing gets amplified uh, if there are many dev teams in our organization. So this is one way of looking at it. There could be multiple snowflake environments. I think I mentioned before, each step team may be using their own base images and we don't know where they came from. Um, so servers are unpatched. You don't know which, which servers need patched, which apps need to be patched. Um, what about TLS communication? What if you wanna to talk to one app to another app? Uh, you have to worry about encrypted communication you know, using servers um, and so on and so forth. The point is, the cost of ops keeps going over, up over time as new services are added. Um, and one way I've seen people solve this problem is adding a dev ops person to a team, but that's very expensive and not to mention less satisfying for the dev ops person uh, who's part of the app developer team. It's just a different, uh, you know, concerns. Um, so I only showed part of the concerns here, uh, but there are other concerns that I, I didn't highlight here since it's just a focus uh, was for app developers only. So let's think about, let's try to think about this contrast this with building an app on CF, Cloud Foundry. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So let's read that. Let's see, okay, we're back to our inner loop. We, we code, we test, everything is great. Um, let me try to push an app to, to, uh, to Cloud Foundry, or to production in this case. So on the left, you see all you do is CF push, right? And then you, you, you saw previously in the slide, I intentionally showed you the files of your node you know, app here. There's just one file that returns hello, and then it just got package.json. All this does when you do CF push is it basically just takes all of the source code, figures out what kind of language um, this, this particular source code is made of, builds that OCI compliant Docker image uh, and then ships that to the registry and takes that and deploys that as just a Kubernetes pod deployment. And you can, in this case, you give instances, two instances uh, to be running. And it does that, exactly that. And then also creates a networking uh, sort of service for you. So you can actually call the app, which you can see on the top right. You can actually look at the logs too, directly for that app. It, it, this logs are your logs. You don't have to share with anyone else. Uh, and you can actually create additional routes if you wanted to, to make sure that, you know, uh, you, you have your own routes and in case you don't conflict with other people in the same organization. Uh, so there's like a checks and balances already built in uh, that allows you to, um, you know, build apps without stepping on other teams' toes. Um, so just to summarize, like, you didn't have to write Docker files. You didn't have to write Kubernetes YAML. You don't have to use third-party sort of Fluentd and other things to run your app. You don't have to use base images, worry about the base images. All you did was run, see a push from your source code and everything was, else was taken care of you. So, uh, and that to me, at least as an app developer, brings joy um, because I don't have to worry about any of the sort of infrastructure or operational level capabilities. All I care about was my code and having that code reach to production environment. And just to be clear, is that CF push is gonna be consistent with your local you know, dev Cloud Foundry instance or production Cloud Foundry, where you will have a CI CD that sustain things, CF push. Awesome, so I'm gonna pause and I will do a quick demo. 
um, of the CF push. So what I have is an existing cluster. Uh, and for purposes of this um, demo, I actually uh, pre-installed CF4K already onto a Kubernetes cluster, in this case, GKE. And I will just show you a very simple example, how to see a push and give you some sort of hints of what's happening uh, behind the scenes. So I will switch to my entire screen and I will, hopefully all can see it, see my screen. So just to confirm, I'm gonna do, uh, to just to verify that I have a cluster I already have Cloud Foundry installed. I'm going to do CF apps, which is my sort of CF CLI, which will, I'll use to connect to Cloud Foundry. As you can see, I already have two apps running. I'm going to go ahead and switch to an app. Uh, uh, let's see what I am. Test. Let's see if I could uh, go to my smoke test, which I built. Uh, and just do go push, um, small test, and let's see if it works. Oops, yeah, push. As you can see, the first thing happens, it uploads the code to, uh, to Cloud Foundry, and then it starts detecting the source code. Uh, and as you can see, uh, first thing it does is able to pull the source code from the blob store, which is what we use behind the scenes to store the code bits. More on that later. And it should start detecting the language um, of the source code I just pulled, pushed. I'm doing a live demo, so, um, Hopefully the gods are happy with me. And that's taking a longer than I expected. There we go. So it pulled, it recognized the Go app um, and it's now going on building that image. Oops. Um, that's what not expected, but we can push another Go app that I actually know works. On, on the right side, I'm going to try to go. Okay, this is the app that I actually showed. I'm gonna exit out of this. Seems like there is a there's a error with that. So this is another um, a simple app. Again, same thing. Hello from Node app, which is what you saw in the earlier slides. I'm gonna try to just here push this. Uh, I'll call it Node app, and then hopefully that just is works as well. And I'm gonna close this. As you can see, it requires, it recognizes as a node app uh, that goes as an NPM install. It's creating all the layers it needs to do. It selected the right node engine as well. All right, so the build was successful for this app. Um, now it's actually going to schedule the app. Uh, as you can see, it actually created a new OCI compliant Docker image uh, and pushed that to the Docker Hub.
All right. So in this case, uh, let's see. I can do is call that app. Voila, that node app is actually now available at that endpoint. So I'm going to stop sharing again. I'm going to switch to um, back to my slides and just walk you through a few things on how that all worked. So um, there, are, there are a few things that we are um, using under, under the hood. Um, this is open interest uh, if you are a DevOps person, but it's also good for dev developers to know what's happening behind the scenes. And if you have any specific questions on any of these projects or components, that's what we call them, you can reach out to me um, via Q&A or, or post, post uh, talk as well. Um, to summarize, I have two, two major namespaces. One is the app namespace in the Kubernetes where apps are actually deployed and monitored. So when you notice that the Node app that was available, that was actually uh, in the app namespace. And then there's system apps that contains the Cloud Foundry components that do all of that magic from CF push to actually to the point where you're able to curl the app. A um, few things to sort of uh, look at this one is we are built on top of Kubernetes ecosystem projects, especially from CNCF, uh, such as Istio, uh, FluentD, Cloud Native Build Packs, uh, which is actually a packet of build packs as an implementation of Cloud Native Build Packs. Uh, and, and, and we did this because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and, and what CFRocades does is it stitches them together to provide the desired outcome for app developers and the operators. Um, there are some components that we wrote ourselves, the cloud controller, which is the C, backs the CF CLI API that you just saw, um, and then logging and metrics that take uh, all of that, um, collect and curate the content from FluentD and make sure that when you do CF logs, you actually are able to uh, get those uh, logs yourself. Um, and extensibility uh, also is another a big part of the value proposition. Operators have the options to opt out of the in-cluster database in the blob store that you see here, Postgres and Minio, and instead using external services for high availability for data services. That's another sort of where we are looking into how can we provide extensibility to the operators. Uh, control. Uh, operators can control the type of base images, and we'll see that in a moment, uh, how they can use it, but they can control the base images used by the applications. For Node, you saw that we were using Node Engine and NPM install. The operators can control what type of base images applications use, so you don't have to worry about it. All you have to give the operators is just the source code with the right construct, and we will, the CF Cloud Foundry will do the rest. Um, and there are many more advantages the operators and developers uh, that get from using Cloud Foundry. I'm going to assume at least you heard about it. Um, the, we have Cloud Foundry that's the, the sort of the um, stable uh, version, which is on the VMs. So this is a brand new project that's only focused on the Kubernetes. Um, I'll move forward and I recommend you take a screenshot of this and ask me any questions you may have again uh, later. Um, all right, a quick check. So how does an app get built? Um, so this is a very high level sequence flow and it will take a whole hour to just go through each of these boxes. Uh, or, uh, so if you have any questions again, you can ask me at the end of the session or the Slack channel. So as I mentioned, your code goes through the Blobster. This is where you are basically, all of your code is uh, put. And then um, any, any subsequent uh, pushes are gonna be fast because the the, the Cloud Foundry actually knows um, uh, the difference between the code that exists on the Blobster versus what's on your, what's on your folders. So, um, so subsequent CF pushes will be incremental. All right, once the uh, code is pulled in, um, then it, it triggers a build process. Uh, in this case, we are using KPAC, which you saw in the previous um, slides. KPAC is a, a build server that actually uses Pocato build packs um, to actually not only uh, uh, systematically detect 
um, the, the languages, uh, the language itself. So in this case, Node, uh, it will look for certain files in the folder structure of the app. With Go, it will look for GoMod. Um, and once it detects the language, it starts building the OCI compliant image with the right set of dependencies and executables, um, including the base image. Uh, so this is why you didn't have to build a Docker file. Uh, you didn't have to write all of the run and copy instructions that you saw in the first few slides because it builds it for you. Uh, once the image is built, it pushes it to the app registry, uh, which, you, you know, if you had gone through the install process of CFOK, uh, you provide that at the time of install. Uh, and this is something the operators would do. Uh, once that is done, it sets up a proper network services. So the reason you could curl the app uh, was because it's able to create that routing, not only um, with the domain name, but the, the, the URLs that you may have like slash path through or bar uh, and map those to the correct apps. So the, all of that uh, uh, machinery is done by within Cloud Foundry. So imagine if there are two app dev teams, the both one has foo and one has bar, they get their own direct URLs to the apps, but they're all put in one namespace and somehow you know, Cloud Foundry is able to figure out who, when it looks at the domain, which one it should go to. Um, after that, it sets up the right permission and resource policies uh, for the for the app itself. So make sure that it has certain network policies, um, maybe enforce certain no egress policies, uh, enforce that they can talk to other apps unless, you know, exclusively granted permissions. Imagine if you had to do all of that yourself, the pain that would be for you to actually start establishing our back and network policy rules uh, writing natively in Kubernetes. Um, and then once all of that is done, it returns the app status, which you saw where it says app is running and here's the memory and disk space it's using. Um, obviously a lot of, a lot is happening, but if you look at it from this vantage point, it is the same steps that you took previously um, and just automated for you. Uh, and CF push creates an abstraction and hides all of that complexity behind the scene on Kubernetes, just like it did in the previous sort of the, uh, on the VMs. Okay, so kind of moving forward, um, we know the Node app that I use for this very simple app. Uh, you know, real apps actually have more needs. Uh, they, they need databases, they need app services. So how do you, um, you know, uh, how do you how do you begin set, setting that up? Um, so one key benefit of using Cloud Foundry is that it uses um, open source broker API, um, which allows any independent service providers to provide services to your apps. So you may want to connect to let's say AWS database service uh, for high availability or S3. Uh, well, you can do that with Cloud Foundry service bindings. All you have to do is, as you can see in the first bind or database service, you create a service by attaching that MySQL plan to your app and you automatically get an instance provision for you, MySQL instance, with, um, with the right passwords and uh, usernames. Uh, so you can read that in your app and then connect it and they can deploy. Um, there are many uh, ISVs available for you to integrate, but uh, you can also create your own uh, services. So if you want to connect to other apps, this is a microservices path again. But you can do that too with service um, user service binding. Uh, in this example, I, I connected to another app service where I provided the URLs and the port numbers. Uh, and if any credentials I have to, I can do that. So this way, it's a proper way to sort of connect uh, apps together uh, or to another services that your, your app is dependent on. Uh, and, and gives you option to swap them uh, anytime. Uh, if, if you want to, instead of use PostgreSQL, you can just do that by switching the, um, the, the, the service, assuming your app can uh, follow sort of, sort of protocol like JDBC and, and not specific to certain database uh, protocol. Okay, so that's sort of, you know, CF services, but what about the day two operations? And, and I talked a lot about how this, uh, in the initial slides, um, the challenges faced by operators and, and in fact, app developers, all of, their, all of the concerns of day two activities fall on them. But the great news is that um, 
with Cloud Foundry, the data operations for apps actually fall onto platform operators. This is their concern. So for example, uh, we talked about Docker file. We talked about the base image and the concern we talked about one was the base image, how do you update when there are new CV fixes available? With build pack, that is actually stack. So stack images are images that contain OS dependencies like Linux or Windows. You know, this is a base image that you probably saw on Docker file. When a new stack CV release is available, the operators can simply deploy that to Cloud Foundry. And what Cloud Foundry will do is it will simply rebase that image. So let's say your app, the Node app that you saw, it will simply swap the base underlying layer, which is a lot faster. And this is part of the build pack spec. I recommend you check it out. It allows you to rebase without rebuilding the images. So it will be much, much faster. And then redeploy those running apps. So that means there is no developer intervention required. You can just be happy coding and the operator is just deploying this behind the scenes and making sure that apps are correctly patched. The second use case that I mentioned is the libraries. You may be using Node.js for the version of Node or some version of Java that has a CV fix, get the same flow. The operators will patch the build packs and language build packs. In this case, we'll rebuild the image because it needs to just go through the whole process. But it's the same thing. They can just deploy that, redeploy those apps without your intervention because you don't package any of the language dependencies in your, in your code or in your manifest. So uh, the outcome is that we have achieved the separation of concerns. Uh, and your, your focus is on the code and the iterations and DevOps focuses on day two. So to summarize, uh, you know, CFO case creates an abstraction layer for app developers. But under the hood, it is using Kubernetes native constructs to achieve the desired outcome for both the app and app developers. So which means from longevity point of view, uh, CFO case can swap out different modules. So for example, if we can swap Istio with some hot new networking project, uh, considering how Kubernetes is moving so fast, I expect this to be less than six months. But the interface remains the same. Operators, operators can simply not install a certain component if they want because they have already installed it on their cluster. Or in this case, let's say operators have KPAC in their system. So in short, um, what CF complements Kubernetes because it increases its adoption for app developers and yet still provides control to operators, uh, both at the CF level and at the Kubernetes level. So where are we headed? Um, so the Cloud Foundry for Kubernetes is an alpha stage, and if you're looking to go 0110 uh, late summer, we released, we have multiple alpha releases, so I highly recommend you all to try it out. Um, VMware, which is my company, is backing this project and is heavily invested in making this an enterprise-ready project. Uh, so here's a quick, quick preview of our roadmap. Um, one thing we're exploring is how to, you know, decouple the components even further. Um, and, and you may have seen recent changes where we uh, created um, CRDs to actually uh, native Kubernetes CRDs to, uh, to have two components talk to each other uh, instead of using a direct API. So, uh, so I recommend checking that out. Um, so we would love you to take, all, take the last release for a spin and give us the feedback. Uh, and there are multiple ways you can actually uh, reach out to us. Uh, so uh, I'll paste the uh, links uh, because the links are not shown correctly, but I'll paste it in the chat. Um, and uh, I'd love to sort of have you get involved or you want to just try it out, let us know. Um, the cloudfoundry.org also has some, um, what I call, um, tutorials uh, that I believe the Karakoda uses the Karakoda tutorial. Uh, you can try that one out too, uh, but I'll place those links for you uh, to the repo. Uh, so you can reach out to us for any questions you may have, uh, how we're building this, what is the, uh, any particular interest you may have about KPAC, build service, language build pack, uh, so on and so forth. So with that, um, I am open to questions. Um, how do I... Trying to see if there are any questions in the queue. Mm. 
Nancy, am I I'm not seeing questions or is this question not here? Just want to make sure. Okay, so I got some few questions. Um, are the slides available for download? I am going to, yeah, it seems like uh, slides will be available soon. Yes, uh, while there, there is Slack channel, seems like there is a, um, there is available. Uh, you can actually go to hash, tra hash to track cloud after the event. I want to also paste some links here. Um, if you all are interested, this is in the chat. Um, so the deploy doc, so um, that you can go check it out. Um, there's a Slack link for you. Um, and then, oh, okay, it looks like the, uh, I just heard that it is only for the, uh, for the staff. Um, I'll have to find a way. I'm, I'll paste the links in the in that Slack channel that Nancy stay, uh, shared. So uh, after the uh, after this discussion. I'll wait around for any more questions. Okay, cool. What is the uh, expected role for pushing code to one environment and Okay, um, I'm gonna keep going. So I have received many questions. Uh, sorry about that. It seems like my UI didn't refresh it, so now I see the questions coming in. Yes, I will. I will share the deck, um, and I'm assuming Nancy has mentioned she will share the deck as well. What is the expected workload of pushing a code to one environment? Promote them after to a higher environment. So um, because of the item potent way of CF pushing it, so as long as your code. Um, is the is same like if you're using certain git shop um you should be able to just use cf push between different environments uh you don't have to uh you don't have to package the docker app because um the the code itself is is frozen uh, it's just that the um the the environments the production environments may have additional policies uh that they may employ uh, behind the scenes but it should it should be the same CF push across multiple environments. What about testing that app still works? Yeah, so I think uh, the question is, what about testing the app still works right with a change in the base image? So usually uh, the way we have seen users do is when there's a base image change um, and the app is rebased. There are certain smoke tests that are run um, all for that app to make sure that the app is out, reachable, routable, uh, at least at minimum. Um, I don't think I don't think uh, it would be advisable to run all of the unit tests that app may have because there are so many apps that are getting updated. So, so that's sort of one way to do that to make sure run certain amount of smoke tests, maybe one or two smoke tests per app when there's a change in the base image. You can also have that uh, in your own pipelines as well, uh, kick off at the same time, just to make sure that it may fail in your pipeline. So at least you know to, uh, you know, uh, let, let your DevOps teams know that you're seeing some challenges. Um, how do you determine the app works for it? I think, yeah, as, as I mentioned, this that's going to be uh, something you would have to, um, uh, you would have to look into, but mostly, mostly the operator will uh, switch base image on a CD fix. They are not going to move. Uh, let's say, like if there is a, a actual breaking change in the OS, like Ubuntu certain version to another Ubuntu that's completely breaking, they they will not do that. That is something you would have to make sure your app works. They will probably give you notification that we want to go uh, to let's say Ubuntu breaking version or major version. Then, then you would have to like update the apps, but the automatic automatic updates that I I shown you, that's mostly always going to be patches which are non-breaking, um, and the ones that are breaking, that will be a manual process to make sure that there there is 
apps have time and lead time to to update their code to so they can work with the uh, like the major uh, changes, major OS changes. Hi, I'm interested in integration of Postgres DB with the app. Um, so to I can I can we are using the the platform we use is or the apps we use open source open uh, it uh, it's I believe it was just right there um, uh, open API open service broker API too many acronyms uh, which allows you any independent service providers so you, if you have a Postgres DB that is running in a cluster you can actually have that connect directly uh, to an app if you want to. Uh, you just have to figure out um, where, sh where the Postgres DB lives, what namespace, and also have to consider the high availability um, cost that you have to incur because you're going to have to make sure that's highly available for your apps. Uh, most recommendations we have for our users is using an external database service, then then use in cluster with along with the Cloud Foundry. Uh, is there a way, any way to implement extra checks on CF push, for example? I believe yes. Uh, many, uh, many users have done additional checks in CF push, um, where they check for man manifest sanitation. Um, they check for things like an app asking for 100 instances or you know massive amount of uh, memory or or disk space. So those are some of the checks we have seen people employ. Um, when they when they do see a push, it actually works really well for customers. Are there more? Uh, this is page two. Uh, is this Kube, uh No. So so someone asked, is it kubectl? It is not a kubectl. Uh, kubectl is a project that is trying to take the existing Bosch releases. So these are the Bosch VM releases. And try to convert them into Kubernetes or try to port them into Kubernetes native um, uh, containers. So uh, it uses something called CF operator, which is an operator uh, um, on Kubernetes project that actually converts a Bosch release into, uh, into a, a container. Um, so so it's, it's using an existing set of Bosch releases to, to move towards Kubernetes. CF4K is full, fully focused on just using the the ecosystem of uh, of CNCF and other Kubernetes projects, and then building from from sort of scratch, if you may. So, what are you using to do CF push, uh, creating the cube deployment? I'm assuming you meant um, the the uh, the deployments. Yeah. So the the irony is responsible for doing that. So what it does is when the app image is built by the build pack service, the irony is given, uh, there's an event which irony listens to and says, okay, I have a pod to schedule and here's the image URL for that and here are all the additional um, data points of that, like how many instances, uh, how, many, how much memory, so on and so forth. And then it then goes in and deploys that in the right namespace. Uh, and so it just it's a very simple deployment spec. I can actually show you uh, my presentation, but, but I can just if you describe the app, you actually will see um, the uh, it's a Kubernetes uh, pod with annotations so that they can the the controllers can watch them. Uh, and the at that point, the logging service will then start scraping the the uh, pod logs and then curate that and give you sort of like a, a curated version. If you do CF logs, which, I, which you saw in the slide, if you do CF logs, it will actually show you all of the apps, uh, events, including errors, access logs, and so on. Is Kubernetes a direct replacement for Diego Cell? That's an interesting question. Um, I think it's just um, where we look at Kubernetes as another sort of an infrastructure layer, so it's, it's sort of like where Kubernetes is taking care of a lot of the deployment aspects, scaling aspects of it. So yeah, you could technically say that, but um, yeah, I, I suppose you could say that. Uh, 
uh, running on CF on cube doesn't um, it add too many abstraction layers? I'm asking because we're trying to carve out an exit strategy from running open source cloud foundry to cube for our SaaS apps. Yeah, I mean that's that's a good question. It does add the abstraction layers, but then I think the cloud foundry, the previous VM was such sort of a monolo monolithic app. Like right now, we're really thinking about how should we build it. So what kind of extensibility that you want to give? You could potentially think about it. You could actually stitch all of these together yourself. You can use FluentD, you can use Istio, you can use KPAC, but there's a lot of operational uh, stitching that you have to do um, yourself, so which is a lot of work in my opinion and keeping up with that and, and making sure that they work uh, with, your, with your apps, app developers uh, and creating that abstraction is going to be hard, but this is a trade-off, right? Uh, between getting a good abstraction, the layers it adds versus working directly with some of the n number of projects to create that same experience. So, so those are the, some of the trade-offs you have to weigh in, in my opinion. I believe I answered the uh, uh, question on the Postgres DB, uh, is it open source? Uh, I'm not sure what open source means, but I, I do, I, I can point you to the, uh, to the CFO Gates repository, which is open source, and you can see how we are installing Postgres app. As I mentioned, you would have to use service binding to point the, um, app to the to the in cluster postgres database if you choose to install it there awesome um i'm going to keep going does it have the capability to establish the connectivity between apps under Istio service mesh and generate the still connectivity config automatically read that again does it have the capability to establish the connectivity between apps under istio service mesh and generate the Istio connectivity config automatically? It's a great question. Um, right now, we are, we are basically, as far as I know, we're going as a deny all service and then to rely on the open service um, broker to provide egress. Um, but this is something that we, we should, we, we haven't really explored on how much of Istio uh, capabilities you want to expose to apps in general. Uh, Istio, we are using Istio to uh, create a service mesh for all of the components within CF so that they can, they can talk to or uh, the communication between them is encrypted uh, via the service mesh. Um, but having that available for apps, that's an interesting, I think that's where I'm gathered from that question. Um, yeah, something that, something that we haven't explored. My team uses Bosch and CF with core 40 instances of for basic core. What is the sacrifice of the minimum five nodes deployment? So um, we are in sort of still in the alpha phase of um, CFO case. We, we are working towards figuring out what is the, uh, what is the level of um, scalability in terms of like answer some of the scalability questions that the that enterprises have. So that is still sort of a TBD at the moment. Uh, minimum five nodes is just the minimum requirement to run today, but um, that will change as we start thinking about scaling, let's say 100 apps, 1,000 apps, 10,000 apps. What would that look like? What is control plane, uh, you know, uh, instances would look like? So, so that's still sort of we're working towards that. So I don't have the answer to that at, that, at this moment, Carol. Um, I have one minute left. Um, I think I answered that one. I don't think I have any additional questions. I think I answered most of them. Yeah, um, that was the last of it. I think that was 19. Cool. Um, I think I answered all of and if I did not, please do ask me, uh, ask me in the uh, the chat session um, that Nancy pasted. Cool. Yes. Um, nothing else. Thank you all. I really appreciate you joining me today. 
and those fun sessions for me. I wish it was interactive, but it's not. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, hopefully in the future, we all get to see each other. Nancy, you want to take over? Do that. I'm not sure how to transition here, but I'll just wait till this closes off. <laughs> 